Hi guys, this is Nadia Hilker. I'm playing Magna on The Walking Dead, and you guys are listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through. I hope you guys enjoy this podcast, and I'm sending you all my love. Bye! Hello, my name is Cassie McClincy. I play Lydia on The Walking Dead, and you're listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through. Yeah! Hey there guys, I'm Callan McAuliffe and you're listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through on Talk Through Media. Hey, I'm Lindsley Register and I play Lara on The Walking Dead. You're listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through on Talk Through Media. Hey, this is Ross Marquand and you're listening to The Walking Dead Talk Through. Awesome. <laughs> Survivors, welcome to episode 138 of the Walking Dead Talk Through. I'm LT. I'm Kyle. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and we're back. Yes. We will be covering The Walking Dead Season 11, episode 15, entitled Trust. But before we get started on this week's episode, we did get some feedback for the last episode, Season 11, episode 14, The Rotten Core. All right. Yes. And Megan, um, in her comments for this week, she threw in this little comment from uh, last week's episode. So I put it in here and it was about actually the, uh, the, the sickle girl. (laughs) Yep. And so she said at the apartment complex regarding the noticeable woman with the shaved head and piercings who first let Aaron and Gabe into the building a few episodes ago. The one somebody said looked like an extra from the 100. Well, I definitely saw her as one of the reanimated zombies who ate Carlson. Go back and check it out and tell me if I'm wrong. All right, Megan, I went back. <laughs> and you can't see it here um, on our doc, whatever. So I'll, I'll post this onto the um, episode thread for this week. But um, I went back, so I looked at that episode and then the episode before, and there was the woman who came out to met Aaron, and she had that sickle, and she, you know, she had a shaved head and like these like big earrings. But I thought, like in that in the pictures that I put on our show doc, um, that like the ones that were, the zombies that were like coming back to basically eat uh Carlson, like. I thought one of them might have been her, but then I went back and looked at like what she was wearing when she met Aaron and she kind of has this gray kind of like vest kind of thing on. And then this like almost kind of like a, I don't know, dark maroon or dark red, uh, like sleeves. Right. And I didn't see any of those in that. So it's like, there was once somebody in the top corner of that scene where you kind of get a, like a wide shot of them crawling to go eat him. So, I mean, if, you'll have to let me know where else, if you saw it or not. But I kind of was like, okay, she's not wearing the same clothes. Um, so, I don't think she was one of them. Right. I did think, though, that because in that episode, uh, there was it sounded like there were so many, excuse me, so many people that were being thrown off the roof. Because there was kind of the cut when we're like seeing um, Negan and Maggie and all them or April or whatever that you like just heard like all these no you know screams and yells like when he first pushed you know those two guys off so i don't know i was kind of expecting there was like a lot more out there than what there were but um yeah i didn't see that she was one of them so and and i have to agree from what i saw of course that was my original statement so Mm -hmm. well well just have to um i'll just have to post that on the facebook um group so, Megan, you just let me know if you it's a different scene. Uh, and then she goes on. She said, the actress who played April, the woman who Daryl and Rosita rescued from the money vault, um, only to get eaten by walkers in the house, looked like a cross between Shelley Duvall in The Shining and Sissy Spacek in Carrie, with the long stringing hair, big eyes, and a gape mouth. <laughs> she was just a great casting choice. And I agree. And that's why I said she looked like, and still I can't think of her name, but one of the young ladies that made a lot of B movie slasher films, mm-hmm. she had the look. Yeah, she had the look for sure. It was, 
it's a good choice. She and she acted well. Unfortunately, she just, it didn't last long. Uh, she didn't survive. Sad. Uh, all right. Well, that was all that we got for last week's episode. So thank you so much for that, Megan. So now let's let's head on to this week's episode. So we are back with season eleven, episode fifteen, which is entitled "Trust." It was written by Kevin Debolt, directed by Lily Maria, and her description was: Hornsby marches Daryl and the troops to confront Maggie at Hilltop. Rosita investigates the Miltons. Mm. And so we'll start off with our ratings. So Kyle, go ahead and go ahead and let me hear yours. Yes, I like this episode. Um, yeah, I gave it a nine point five. Stranger danger, Lancey boy. <laughs> Indeed, and I gave it a nine point five. Of all the places to go. And the reason I said that is that we know that probably right now the last place that Negan would be hiding out is at Hilltop with Maggie. Right. (laughs) But then again, Lance doesn't know that, but we know that. And that's why we were all shaking our heads. Yeah. (laughs) And so we definitely got some listener ratings. We'll kick those off with Dieta from Detroit, who says, 9 out of 10, F-bombs a dropping. <laughs> and I think that's a big smile, a, well, that's a curious face, and the mind blown. <laughs> Emojis, yes. Uh, well, next is Glenn from Toronto, and she gave it a 9 out of 10, romancing the stone. Renee from Atlanta says, 10 out of 10. Daryl said the F word, and she has two shocked face emojis. <laughs> uh, and Mike from Asheville gave it an 8 out of 10 appendectomies. Emma from the UK says 7.5 out of 10 Mercer's a cyborg. <laughs> so, with all our ratings out of the way, it's time for the awesome sauce. All right, our first awesome sauce comes from Dieta from Detroit, and she says, Daryl, Maggie, Elijah, about to take Hornsby's head off for messing with Herschel. Take any trips lately? How about your mom? I knew him questioning Herschel was going in badly. Daryl drops a rare TWD F-bomb, and she said, or like, I guess quotes like, you've turned this place upside down and you found nothing, he says to Hornsby. So unless you want to die for nothing, tell them to drop the guns before something really fucking bad happens. <laughs> End quote. Yes, it was so awesome. And then cool face emoji and a, uh, yeah. That's, that's another, that's, I think that's, a, I think we could say that's a laugh real hard. You laugh real hard, Emoji. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, both Kyle and I are too old to be emojiologists. So. <laughs> we try our best. <laughs> we try our best. Okay, Glenn from Toronto says, The walker kills again were good with Aaron smashing the walker with his spiked mallet. Gabriel slicing the walker's face in two and Daryl bayonetting the one walker and walking it around to shoot the other walker. Slick. Yeah, and I thought I noticed that like some of those sh- like because they did really do a, a, an awesome like way they sh- filmed that, but it was kind of also like ah, oh, I think this a lot of this was in the promo <laughs> before the mm-hmm. season started. <laughs> so here they come, and I'll go ahead and say it now. See, kids, that's what the pokey thing on the end of your rifles for. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's how you use a bayonet. <laughs> Megan from Pennsylvania says, our new couple. Woo boy, that escalated quickly. I was just wondering why we never get any Walking Dead sex scenes anymore. Get it, princess. <laughs> Gabe, Aaron, and Daryl talk, taking out the zombies on the road has some really great effects, especially the head sliced in half diagonally, and then it slowly slid down, exposing the brain. And, well, here we go. New Walking Dead startup business ideas. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Mad Mike Mercer's CrossFit Gym. Get sweaty and get ripped in the best gym this side of Omaha. Also, we have Ezekiel Civil War Field Hospital and Horse Stable. Come in, get treated, and get your surgery on a bench amongst lots of furry animals. (laughs) And she finishes up by saying, business is booming even better than Bill's. This message brought to you by Bill's Store. Bill's store in Hog Knuckle, Texas, the best equipped store in the apocalypse. 
<laughs> since we'll be back, since we'll be back to fear before too much longer. <laughs> Oh yeah, Bill is like our unofficial sponsor. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> if it exists in the apocalypse, we've got it at Bill's. Yep. <laughs> Wait a uh, minute. Wait a minute. And, and you realize what this means? I know where. <laughs> I know where Madison is. <laughs> she's, she's in the basement of Bill's. <laughs> this whole time. This whole we, time she's been in the basement. <laughs> Oh goodness! How did it's how like do we looking, not know? You know, looking the, for your canonical actors you can't find. <laughs> Come by Bill's basement B and B. Oh my gosh! It's, it's sitting in front of us this whole time. Oh wow! <laughs> oh oh gosh, it's gonna be good to get fear back. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Megan. Well, next is Emma from the UK, and she says the opening shot of Carlson was pretty awesome. Aaron and Gabriel together are so good. It was so funny when they looked at each other and said to Hornsey, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Don't mess with the boys. No. <laughs> so Renee from Atlanta says, Don't play with Call Me Gabriel and Aaron. Two thumbs up. They shut that shit down real quick. Lance, the crazy guy psycho, couldn't do nothing but walk away. What? Our peeps ain't never scared. This is what they do. And big flex. Maggie telling crazy eyes, many have tried to come up against me and my family, and they're all dead now. Mostly. Period. Don't play with Daryl Dixon, baby. And she's got three flexes, unless you want to die. <laughs> For nothing. Tell them to drop the guns before something really fucking bad happens. And she has, what are those? I think those are, I thought we'll go with roll on the floor emojis. Daryl was like, I'm sick of your shit. And I've seen enough to realize you're just like the rest of those douchebags we've come up against. And I'm not playing your sick, twisted, diabolical games anymore. <laughs> King Ezekiel sitting there chilling while Tommy was sweating bullets because he thought he was going to get in trouble. Baby, our peeps don't break a sweat because they know how to handle themselves. They're used to trouble. Mm -hmm. And she finishes up with Carol, Carol, Carol. Crazy eyes don't even know he's going up against a soldier who does not play and she will shut shit down all the way <laughs> with more flexes. <laughs> uh, I could not, uh, you know, I could not agree more with everything you said, Renee. It's like... Oh, especially uh, like I said, she had she had that look in her eye again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whenever, whenever the smile goes away, you realize that somebody's about to get a cookie. Somebody, <laughs> somebody's about to to get the and bring that casserole dish back clean. Speech. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yep. <laughs> that is too funny. That is true. Don't mess with Carol. Nope. All right. Well, next is Mike from Asheville, and he says, Aaron and Gabe playing it cool while being questioned by Hornsby. Yep. Uh, Aaron and Gabe taking care of the walkers and Daryl stepping in to help. Daryl giving no shits about where his loyalties lie. He's putting himself at risk straight to Hornsby's face with no regrets. Totally agree. Uh, Mercer and Princess. Mercer being a beast. Mercer soft side being big brother and also open, opening up to princess. That man is hurting. Eugene and Max, such a sweet moment. And Ezekiel building a makeshift hospital to give back. In previous episodes, he was shutting down, thinking he would die. I love seeing the new life in him. Agreed. It was actually, let's just, we'll go into my awesome sauce. <laughs> I'll totally agree with that. Since we've gone through the listeners, awesome sauce, it's time for ours. And once again, our listeners have pretty well stolen everything I wanted to cover. Um, but I'll go ahead and hit a few of them. The whole thing with Aaron and Gabriel, those two guys have been through so much together. And the fact that, you know, Hornsby's going, you know, isn't it odd that only you two survived? And I'm kind of thinking, well, no, <laughs> you know. Given given the fact of what those two guys have been through, especially as a team, yeah, I mean, no, it wasn't surprising that they survived. Um, 
I think it's funny that he's trying to be all, you know, hard ass with them. And then it was like, no, oh, hey, that's fine. And I'm going, uh. I don't like the fact that they're on Hornsby's radar because he's, you know, we've already shown that he's Weasley enough that he might try something underhanded. But again, you are talking about the dynamic duo there. Yeah. And we've seen, like I said, we've seen the two of them survive a lot together. And especially when they had their little, hey, why don't you guys go take care of those walkers? And I'm thinking, that is the punkest move. You've got all those guys that are armored and, you know, all your troopies, and you send the two guys that aren't armored and aren't heavily armed out to take care of this little group of walkers. And, of course, Daryl's going to go back them up because, you know, they're... They're a family. They're a team. They work together. And I would have been more shocked if Daryl would have stood there. Yeah. But it's the same old thing. If, you know, two of the two of the crew go out and the, there's more crew members there, they're going to follow suit. And as we've said before, our guys know how to take care of walkers. And it's, it's just kind of in the cards for that. And I thought it was... You know, it was pretty cool, the fact when they walked back after all the walkers were done, it's like, yep. Yeah. yeah. Next. Yeah. I, that, I, I, like, that was pretty much my awesome, too, was just that, uh, just the whole scene. But also, it's like, it just puts into, like, in my mind, though, too, it's just like, Hornsby thinks that he's like, you know, like this head honcho smart you know like or i don't know like he you know he's trying to like like we know he doesn't trust them and we know that oh he knows he knows that they're all can you know together and they've been together but he's still trying to like i don't know act like he's just you know like he's can kind of figure it out or make them trip up or something like that like get them to like kind of stumble over the words and be like oh yes you know but they don't they're just like they totally just sat there while he was like trying to do this whole, you know, talking through the whole situation. And they're just like, yep, that's how it happened. <laughs> you know? And, and it's, it makes me also think that it's like, like Lance is kind of like in this like little, like in a position where he can't quite just, you know, I don't feel like that he thinks like he could just like kill them on sight. Or do something like that. Like yeah. he's almost he's almost stuck with them because he's also trying to be like hiding what's going on from I you know from Mil Pamela Milton or like whoever you know he's like trying to do this all under the table and it's blowing up and he's just trying to clean up the mess and he's trying to blame them or do whatever but like yet yeah, he can't quite you know he like he almost doesn't have like that many cards to play because he's dealing with our people who are like. <laughs> they've been through everything and right. this is not a new situation. And I think that he sees rightly so that Maggie is going to be a problem mm -hmm. just because she, she's, she's charismatic and has uh, a following with her people that I think Lance wishes he had. I think that Lance wishes that he had that kind of loyalty that she has. Um, so he would see her as a threat. And I think that he knows or, or strongly suspects that it was Maggie at the apartment complex, but he just can't prove it beyond just some real circumstantial type evidence. So, I don't think it's going to be good for our people going forward as long as Lance is working towards getting rid of them or furthering his plans. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, you know, he still can't 100% have a bulletproof case to where he can, like, take it to Pamela and say, this is what they're doing. Well, right. Cause he's because the problem is going to be he's got – you know, he's got so many balls in the air that I think if he exposes one part of this, then the whole house of cards is going to collapse. Yep. Yep. And, you know, I think my other, my other bit of awesome I want to go into since I'm talking about 
Hornsby is I think that he's he's kind of playing with fire the fact that he's sort of hired Leah now mm-hmm. to be his goon because I think she would just as soon kill him as she would kill everybody else. Yeah, it's that whole well, and some of our listeners had same, you know, some kind of the same questions too. It's just like it, it it's like, wait, what are you doing? Like you're you well, know, it's the whole thing of any, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my, friend, my friend, but right. but that's still dangerous. But I think, and- <laughs> in, well, it's very dangerous with her because I think that now, just from what I've gathered, you know. I've just got to go ahead and say it because we've already gotten our expletive tag for this week. (laughs) Um, She's nuttier than squirrel shit. And I think that, you know, something is going to bust loose. And I I don't think I would trust her. I, if I was going to send her out, I would have to send a couple of really solid guys that I knew I could trust to kind of be the backstop on that because there's nothing stopping her from doing the same thing, you know, to, to him. Right. Right. And he might not be thinking he may not be, but the problem is, I think, I think he is. And it's sort of like a, I think it's a measured risk in his mind, Mm -hmm. but to your point is as much as he's been drinking and plotting, I don't know if if the introduction of our guys has kind of pushed him out on the edge and maybe he's not thinking as well as he should. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to sidebar really quick and say, you know, we were we were all talking about what a good job the actor that plays Sebastian was doing. Well, I want to go ahead and give props this week to Josh Hamilton, the guy that plays Hornsby. Because I think he is really he he's not quite he's not quite to the point of being uh, the guy we really love to hate, but it's the fact that he he does that used car salesman we've talked about, and then turns around and you see that he's really got some diabolical stuff going on too, so. The you know, the acting has been so good, especially with all the people they've brought in from the Commonwealth side. But I just wanted to give specific kudos to him just for the job he's doing. And this is one of those I really want to see what happens because how many times have we you and I been here since I you know started co-hosting and we're going well, the acting was good, but the writing was kind of off, and we really wish there had been more more tension and a more, you know, a more palpable bad guy. And how weak we thought the intro to the uh, to the Pope crew was doing, and it really sucks that this is it because they've really stepped their game up so much. That this is like, oh, come on. Do we really have to stop? Because th- this has been so much better and so good compared to some of the stuff we've gotten previously. Yep. Agreed. And just to finish up what I was going to hit on, um, I'll start off with Ezekiel that everybody made the point of, Yeah, before he had his surgery, it seemed like he had resigned himself to, you know, potentially dying slowly or not being better. And he might not have felt that well. But since he got the surgery, you kind of see, you know, again, props to Kari Payton. You you see the old jovial King Ezekiel coming back out. That, you know, he's a little theatrical and he's funny and he's engaging. But as we have always said, Ezekiel as a leader always thought about his people. It was always, you know, taking care of the people in the kingdom was one of his first priorities. And the fact that he started this little backdoor clinic is 
part of what we love about that character. He saw a need and he's doing something to address it because he he may he may have been you know titled king but he definitely cared for his subjects if you want to go there you know he cares about the the common folks and you can see that that's something he would do and he knows you know he knows how to get things done and that's he's addressing a need yeah no for sure, because yeah, it's like that. That was one of my parts, like one of my awesome is because I just I loved seeing him being King Ezekiel, you know. And it was like, like when he went and met, you know, like with Judith and RJ were like with Carol, you know, and he does his whole like performance. I was just all like, he says something, and he's like, uh, he's all like, drink deep from the cup of knowledge and listen to your teachers, you know. And it was like all grandiose and this and that, and just like very like total like that was. That's that's King Ezekiel. That's who we first met. It was a very old school Ezekiel line to to, to give. Yeah, and I just loved it because it's like, you know, after seeing him down and like you know being kind of torn about the fact that you know Carol kind of made a deal or whatever to get him in the list to save his life to like he's back on you know like he's feeling better and now kind of got this like you no know, like new pep in his step and then doing something about it and i think you're right it's like that he cares for the common person like he cared for the people that he you know led at the kingdom mm-hmm. and now here he is at the commonwealth and he's like where can i make a difference and that's what he's doing and you know like i'm sure that you know he's that's if Pamela Milton or any of the Commonwealth, you know, soldiers or whatever knew, you know, he'd be in trouble, but he's doing the right thing. And, you know, for, because we've seen now with the way Sebastian has been, where he somehow is like these people that are, are like on Hornsby the same way. He like, he knows about it. It's like, oh, the people that are like, they somehow get them indebted to them. And then so, oh, to pay your debt off, go get this money from this, you know, like they send them out to go do some like, you know, probably impossible right. task just cause they know they can. And it's just like, it, you know, it's not how, you know, that things should really happen and be. <laughs> well, and, and to that point, it's the fact that Sebastian sees these people that owe him something as kind of expendable. Yeah. That it's like, if they get the stuff, great, they could do something else. And if they can't, Oh, well, too bad. I'll just get somebody else to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he would not be doing anything to help somebody that, you know, needed a surgery, you know, no, it, it's, no. it's all self-serving for him to get his credit. <laughs> they got cut off from mommy. Uh, I also thought it was nice to see like when he, um, when they were t- at the hospital, like uh, somebody was like, Hey Zeke. And so it's kind of like, he's got his other little nickname, you know, from, the people you know that he's working with so i thought that was kind of a neat little touch right because it was really quick there's like they were just walking basically into the next Mm -hmm. shot and someone's like oh hey zeke (laughs) well and and the fact that he's you know he's one of those people you put him in a new community and he's making friends he's getting to know people yep yep making an impression and making friends Mm mm-hmm um, uh, the only we've kind of talked about the Aaron Gabriel thing because I that, that was just a great opening and it was tense, so I you know, don't really have any more to say to that. Uh, but one of the other things I thought was kind of awesome I mean, I guess it's awesome or just more like because everybody else kind of hit some of the same things. So it's just like Max telling Mercer when they were like when he was at the gym, basically trying to like get him to be like, hey, you could you can lead, you could do more. And he's like, no, I'm a soldier. Right. But her, her quip to come back is like, well, maybe you're just a poster. <laughs> and I was just like, ouch. <laughs> well, when she said, you know, you're the face that people see. Right. And he said, I'm just a soldier. And then she was like, well, maybe you are just a poster. Yeah. I, I think seeing, seeing the scene, the second scene with Mercer and Princess. It's making me like Mercer's character more because you knew he was strong. You knew he was, you know, duty bound and was trying to toe the company line and do what he was told. 
but you also see that he's a deeply honorable guy and the stuff that happens yeah, you know, he has the game face on, but it but there's things that bothered him. But he keeps saying, Well, if I don't do it, somebody else will or they'll replace me. And it's that thing of he probably feels he's in a position to do as much good as he can, but he can't do as much as he wants to because you can't rattle the you know, you can't yeah. shake the tree but so much. Yeah. But I think that we're seeing the fact he's opening up to Princess, and maybe now we're going to see a little bit more of his, I won't say vulnerable side, but maybe his his side that is able to be, you know, talked to to do the right thing. Because somebody, you know, we had we had speculated about, you know, is Mercer going to be involved in the uh, resistance? Well, I don't know if he's going to be involved in the resistance, but I definitely can see him teaming up with some of our people to kind of do the right thing. I won't say to the Commonwealth. I think it's more like do the right thing for the Commonwealth. But yeah, yeah. Because, like he said, they've got 50,000 people that are depending on him. Well, if you've got that many people that have got it relatively good, and you can convince them that, well, things could be better if we would address these issues, some people may be able to be talked into helping. I mean, granted, I don't know if... You know, we we've talked about it before. The whole thing that they've been sheltered for a long time, but I I still think that there's some hope there, or there's definitely seeds of conflict, because you've got people like Hornsby who want to maintain the status quo because their power is basically set on all those people continuing to toe the line and do what they're told, while he can enjoy his relative life of luxury and continue his evil Machiavellian schemes. <laughs> and I think the problem after this week is that sort of come to a head. And I think he's going to run into, uh, as we know, as viewers, what happens when some external group tries to make the Alexandria crowd do something they don't want to do. <laughs> right <laughs> it's not too pretty <laughs> not too pretty at all uh, and i would not i would not count out uh my perpetual wild card in all this is that hornsby's pissed negan off mm-hmm. he's pissed maggie off he's pissed aaron off uh, i think that Enough of the enough of the old crew is dissatisfied with Lance at this point. So uh, it would not be good for him if we get the band back together. And on top of that, as somebody's already said, you know, Carol's Carol's got that look in her <laughs> eye. Yes, and that's like starting to turn into like okay is because she's still back at the commonwealth doing whatever you know her multiple mm-hmm. jobs she's gotten like you know the like command of the soldiers there in some form and then lance is still outside the walls doing his thing with our people so yeah it's like i don't know yeah setting up for like okay it's like something what's going on when if he does return home <laughs> like uh, oh i'm telling you it's the they are definitely setting something up and we've got what one episode left before the break so i have a feeling i just have a feeling that we're gonna have a lot to talk about next week <laughs> yep because they're gonna I don't know how much they can get resolved, but I guarantee you they're setting up the, well, it is the last season. So they are setting up, I hope, one of the most tense, you know, pre, 
pre-break cliffhangers that we're going to get. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. Well, and that's like, like you said, like w- just the start of this part two to like where we're at. It was like, you know, if it, it, it feels like they are starting to really hit their stride and every episode mm-hmm. is like, just, it's, it's good. It's entertaining. You know I mean? Obviously there's little quibs here and there, but it's like, it's suspenseful. It's like, it's real, it's tense. It's like, I don't know. It's they're really, really, really doing a good job. So I'm, yeah. I think next week we're definitely going to have a lot to talk about. But then to basically let's see where they're setting us up for because you know we don't know exactly when they're coming back. So, <laughs> oh yeah, all we know is it is sometime later this year. Yep. Uh, well, all right. Well, that was all that I had really to add. Okay, well, if we all clear the awesome sauce, then it's time for the weak sauce. You're worthless and weak. All right, well, we'll kick off the weak sauce with some listener weak sauce. And on top of the list is Megan from Pennsylvania. And she starts off, Mercer confessing to Princess that he murdered two men. Standing in the hallway of a residential building where anyone could hear you around the corner instead of walking into the private apartment right in front of you. Yeah, I'll I'll give you that one. She goes, another week, Sauce. What kind of goofy pants did they put Max in? I couldn't tell if they were light pink or off-white, but they were an unflattering mess with the waist jacked up to her sternum. That poor, pretty lady looked like a high-fashion nightmare. (laughs) And Mike from Asheville cuts in to say, I thought the same thing. Mercer's smart enough to... To not stand in the open talking, especially something that critical. And yes, Max's pants drove me crazy. The high waist was too much. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it was very, I didn't actually like really notice that or like, it never crossed my mind until after I read the comments and did my rewatch. And I was like, oh yeah, dang. (laughs) Like that, like they, she's almost like she's wearing like a pantsuit, but no, you know, jacket or something (laughs) yeah it was it was very pantsuity and the fact that yes it was very high-waisted and had those very wide legs Mm -hmm. i'm just going not the most flattering look maybe this is the power professional suit of the commonwealth but you know (laughs) well we'll we'll see because i after you know Poor Max, because Renee's been on her about her hair, and now, and now <laughs> Megan's going after her her clothes. So they they they're not doing a great job. I mean, she's she's had a lot better outfits. Let's just go there. Yeah, <laughs> whoever's in their costume department is not doing a good job. <laughs> well, I think I think they're I think they're making a point, but it's just not the point we wish they were making. Making. <laughs> yep. So uh, next is Dieta from Detroit, and she says, Hornsby and his little army finding Leia hiding in the woods with all his guns. So she is that close in the vicinity of Hilltop and River End with all the guns and no one else finds her? Uh, eye roll, thinking face, and then, like, meh face. I call bullcrap. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, Emma from the UK says... Don't stand with your back to the edge of the building when Hornsby's interrogating you. Come on, people. Don't have a really sensitive conversation that could get you killed with your girlfriend in the hall, Mercer. Go inside, for goodness sake. So, what is Carol's job exactly? Working for Hornsby, yes, but she's got shoulders in her pocket now and they're not going to tell. What has she got over them? Just didn't seem quite plausible to me. She says, great job on the field hospital, Ezekiel, but it's quite a setup, pretty easy for the soldiers to find when doing their rounds. Mind you, they're inept, so I suppose it's a pretty safe bet they won't find it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and that's, that's probably kind of why they didn't find the wagon full of guns, but... Yeah, they're very... I mean, they're very... Uh, you know, this is obviously, it's like, I'm sure for plot reasons, they're just like, oh no, they can just totally have this house. So no one's going to like question Ezekiel's, uh, you know, 
stable because he's the animal person. So that's, he's doing his job for the Commonwealth. But I just thought it's, it, you know, it's like we have, like, there was the scene when Maggie and Daryl and all of them were basically like guns pointed at Hornsby and the Hornsby's like, he's like, like everybody lower your weapons. And then it's just like, like that instance, yeah, you know, all the tr- troop, like basically stand at attention, you know, and like drop the guns or whatever. Like that, it, it's almost kind of like they're making the soldiers of the Commonwealth very like robotic, like where it's just like, they just only, you know, do what they're told. Mm-hmm. And if someone's, if their leader says, okay, you know, stand at attention, it's like, drop your weapon. It's like, they just immediately just like click the heels and they're like, stand up straight. <laughs> well, and I'll have to say, well, the immediately lowering the weapons part, I kind of get not that shouldn't necessarily be so snappy. But yeah, if you if you're like parade ground stuff, yeah, if you fall in, you fall in. If you snap to attention, you snap to attention. But it just seems it seems a little out of place when you're out on patrol. Mm-hmm. And as as we have said before, they're getting you know they're starting to get a little more stormtroopery as we go in. Just to go riff off of what image said uh, you'd think that if so, there was a huge sudden spike in visitation at the pet and zoo somebody would notice that they'd start going hey that new zookeeper guy we got must be awful popular there's a lot of people going in there to scratch bunnies and goats <laughs> and they seem to be coming out with bandages on their heads what's up with that yeah and, and, and yeah, the fact that they were out there looking for this missing cart of guns and then they suddenly find it when they need to, mm-hmm. it kind of makes me think that, well, how hard were they looking before? <laughs> if it was this easy to find, then why didn't they find it before? Yeah. Cause you think it's like wherever the like wherever Hilltop is to where River Bend, the building was like, right. they, they go to Hilltop, don't find anything. But then on their way back is when they find Leia. And it's like, so it's kind of like, yeah, like where did they go north this time instead of south? Well, you know, like, wh- and if they're that close, how come we've never seen this building before up until now? Right, right. So it's just, yeah, little- is it like, it's like suddenly. Oh, that area of the map is now clear. We can go there. <laughs> yes, it's been it's been scouted, so that's like you did. Yeah, you didn't see the little pop up. It's like you know, ding! You've now unlocked sector five. Yeah. <laughs> you know, real real life is not like an MMO that you <laughs> suddenly get this. You know, oh, I can see into the map now. We have this new new county unlocked. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's kind of like you would think that they were going basically on their route that they know of to go back and forth and somehow they have. Right. And hiding. think about, and my thing would be, think about this. What have they been doing up until the point the Commonwealth showed up at Alexandria? It's like, we're so hungry. We need food. We're starving. We've combed the countryside looking for food. <laughs> and they didn't find the, this apartment complex is full of people. Yeah. And it's close enough that we can get there relatively shortly. But then again, we don't know how long it took because it was dark. So maybe they were walking all day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. True. So, uh, I don't know. I, I no, it's just it's a fuzzy, and it just is like it's just it is what it is. So it, but it does kind of, yeah, it does bring up those like those questions, kind of like wait, now how is this really working again? Like, yeah, and Leia just like did she she finds these guns, but then what is she doing? Like, does she going to Hilltop? You know, it's kind of like what wouldn't she just been like I'm getting the heck out of Dodge and like going somewhere else, or you know, like. It's Anyways, like, now I have a, I have a wagon load of guns. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up a very large tent and take a nap. <laughs> yes, <laughs> by the roadside. By the roadside. That was the part that I was kind of going. 
No, this is what we call an ambush. And it was. Mm -hmm. Because if she was really that much of a snake eater, she would not be sleeping in a big ass tent that was obvious to see. You know, she would have curled up with her with her bedroll and her poncho and found a place to root in the ground so she you wouldn't be seen. Or maybe climb up a tree so that you don't actually get numbed by a random walking zombie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just think that the big you know, the big Boy Scout summer camp tent was just a bit much for me. <laughs> Yep, I and agree. and just to go editorial sidebar on that as well, uh, having had to set up tents of that appropriate size for both reenacting purposes and for scouting purposes, that's not a one body job. You can do it. There's some tricks to set a tent that size up by yourself, but for the most part, it's a pain in the butt to do it by yourself. So again, you know, unless we were going to be treated to some lantern light on the side of the tent, Leah taking a bath or changing clothes, I just don't see the utility of having the big tent. So since we've already started weaking a little bit, um, so you've taken a team of troops to Hilltop and you're trying to turn the place over to look for clues and look for these guns. It just seemed to me that the only person that was really doing any real digging and looking was Hornsby. You know, it just seems like everybody else was just walking around going, nope, I don't see anything. Nope. <laughs> nope. Nothing over here. Yeah, it would have it would have sold me a little more had you seen some of the guys, you know, turning over pieces of tin and throwing things aside and kind of looking in corners and or like for yeah, forcing their way into like a room like at the like a or uh, or looking for places that would be obvious to hide things in because there's still lots of buildings. It just like, like I said, you never saw them like looking in sheds, looking under floorboards, you know, looking in boxes and bundles and bales. Every time you saw the troopies, they were just milling around. I, I just, that part of it was just a little, a little, it's like, okay, we're here to search for the guns, but we're just going to kind of wander around aimlessly for a while until something tense happens. <laughs> And as far as things go, I mean, that's really, you know, the whole thing, like I said, Leah, Leah's campground and just the whole thing about searching. Now, I kind of wondered, you know, on one hand, why Mercer would suddenly open up to Princess. You know, maybe they've been, you know, relating better than one would assume. But the other side of it is, is that, and I, I hate to put it this way, but I guess there's no other way to put it. Uh, you know, apparently if Mercer, you know, if Mercer's been flying solo for a while, and this is like the first steady loving he's had, I could kind of see why he would suddenly start spilling his guts about everything to this girl that he hasn't known that long. I was going to say like maybe every guy ever, but uh, I don't know I, that. It wasn't just the conversation, the fact he was doing it in the hallway where everybody could hear. It's just this the sudden the sudden emotional info dump to yeah. somebody that we don't know how long they have been, you know, together. <laughs> so, you know, I obviously didn't get all of his frustrations out in the gym. Uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> well, and he's being cha challenged by Max too, so he's going through like a lot of stuff. So maybe that's part well, yeah, of it. because we we can tell by the dynamic that he's always been, you know, she's been the one that's always needed the firm, steady hand to help her out through things, and I get the impression that uh, it was the two of them together quite a bit. Uh, maybe more so than mom and dad 
you know, I, I'm going to infer that the two of them managed to survive together, you know, as brother and sister, as opposed to a whole familial unit. We may find out to the contrary later, but it just kind of strikes me that way. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. With and that. I think that this may be the first time that she kind of, uh, grew a backbone and kind of pushed back against him. No, I would totally agree with that. Cause I mean, we don't really know much of their background, but they do, they do like what we have seen, you know, we know they have, a, I mean, a seemingly tight relationship and we don't know like what happened, you know, where were that, what was their standing, you yep. know, before, and then how did they get to where, you know, you know, Mercer's lead, you know, right. soldier and she's Pamela Milton's aide. So and about that, I'm going to throw it in here in the weeks just because part of that belongs here is I don't necessarily fault Eugene for doing the ask, but you would think as much crap as he is kind of stirred up for Max is the next thing you're going to do is you're going to ask her, hey, go ahead and do some poking around in this potentially sensitive and trouble inducing line of questioning. <laughs> and I'd really appreciate it. I'm like a little too soon there, Eugene, just a little too soon. <laughs> and I, I'm throwing that in here because I've got some more about them too in a minute, but okay. uh, I'm, and I, and I'm going to, I'm going to weak it here only because there's, just seems like the place to put it since we're here now. I, I'm glad that, you know, Connie has got her Geraldo Rivera investigative reporter Jones on. <laughs> but I, I just wonder, you know, it just seems kind of odd. It's like now she's going to drag Rosita into it. And she's going to kind of, I mean, Eugene sort of knew, you know, Eugene sort of knew something was weird after his past couple of episodes i just wonder if this is gonna if this is gonna end up putting you know rosita in a bad place now that she's going well there's something you know i knew something was going on but now you know this sort of starts making sense so she's gonna start digging around i i just hope that this is not going to end up being the obvious plot point that is going to cause the problem. Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> that kind of is leading into what I put in my what sauce about this whole situation. Okay. Well, so. we'll, we'll we can we can we can what it in a minute. We're close. So, I think we can wrap week up and let's just go ahead. What? 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 All right, Megan from Layman, uh, Megan Layman from um, Williamsburg, Pennsylvania says Lance Hornsby is a crack mechanic, question mark, and apparently a psychic one because he can look under the hood of a truck for about 15 seconds, barely touching anything, and somehow diagnose whether or not whatever that repair he mentioned had been correctly performed so that it should be able to run. Well, obviously, it's true. And obviously, if Lance was that good of a mechanic, he missed his calling. <laughs> yeah. You actually need to be working on cars and not be a politician, sir. Mm hmm Yeah. All right. So we got some what's all from Renee from Atlanta. She says, Daryl saying the F like it was out of nowhere. I know they used that word, but it just caught me off guard that they said it loud and clear. I had to rewind my TV several times to make sure I heard what I heard. She goes on to say, what the heck was up with that Commonwealth soldier's face looking like that? His face looked like it was mangled or something. And she finishes up by saying, I knew Mercer and Princess were feeling each other, but I didn't know they were feeling each other literally. <laughs> and she finishes up by saying, Mercer is one fine Hershey kiss. <laughs> and trailed some heart emojis. <laughs> yes, Mercer's a big dude. He is a pretty man. Yep. Oh, all right. Well, that was all our listeners what saw. So I guess, yeah, I'll just go into mine, which kind of was 
part of like what you were talking with your week, but yep, yep, yep. I mean, I, I kind of wrote in saying it was like, it was a minor one, but it was like, after thinking about it, it was just like, it was kind of like, what or who are Connie and Kelly going to tell about what they find out about the list of names? Like Rosita was telling them about what you know Sebastian was doing, and then Eugene comes up and is like saying that they're telling them because of their position as a truth-telling news person. And so I was like, "Wait, is Col- like, are you trying to get her to like, like write this up in the newspaper? You know, like, because you know her boss would not even like, you know, sh- she's obviously not going to let anything like that happen." And then it was just kind of like, well, why did they just go to them? You know, I'm like, why didn't they do that? Like go up to Carol or Daryl or like even Yumiko. Like that to me seemed like, why wouldn't they like, where is Yumiko? Are they not like seeing her every day or they talk to her? And like, are they not trading this information between our group of people? And it was just kind of like, it just felt weird. Like, I, I don't know. It just didn't click to me in that scene because I just felt like this would be something that everybody would be sharing with each other. So everybody's on the same page. Our people don't just like, Oh, well they're busy. So I'll just go over here and just, Hey, let's go investigate and do all this stuff. I don't know. I just, I felt like this seemed very weird that Rosita and Eugene are like going to them to like, okay, now go investigate, you know? And then it still turns into like basically Eugene's, getting max involved you know i don't know i just i I felt like this is just being so tightly kept secret with just these people but i'm like carol would be the first person i would tell (laughs) you know i'm like like daryl would be the first person i would go tell like oh my gosh hey this is what i just found out like have you heard anything i mean i get that daryl's out of the walls right now but still it's like this this list was known about so i don't know right I felt like there was just this weird, like, oh, they're doing their thing. And so, okay, let's just handle our thing. And then again, Yumiko, I still don't understand where she's at. We haven't seen her in for a well, long time. She, and I, I'll throw this out here. It just seems funny that everybody was talking about, oh, Connie and Daryl are back together. Connie and Daryl. Can, and then it's like, <laughs> no Daryl Aki. <laughs> <laughs> that's true it's just, they cut them apart that it's it's just connie and kelly you know uh, throwing exposition and signing to each other in subtitles about what they're f- trying to figure out um uh, i figure that based on the scene we had was it like three weeks ago i think yumiko has gotten her a position in upper management doing lawyery things. So she's she might be, you know, in some office building somewhere being law lawyerly. So they may not see her. Now with if Daryl and Rosita are out doing foot patrol, it would be more likely that they could be seen. Now granted they're 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 out of town doing some out of town kind of things. But yeah, if you're going to, if you're going to try to expose somebody, I think and Grant, we've said Connie's being all investigative reportery, but you're exactly right. Who is she going to tell? It's not like they have a Commonwealth YouTube channel. So she could <laughs> like make videos. It's not like she has a, uh, a webcast so she can be like Alex Jones or something. And, and I would pretty much guarantee they don't have a tabloid like, you know, the national Enquirer. Right. Right. Exactly. That, like you said, I kind of expect her editor to do, uh, like the old school J Jonah Jameson did to Peter Parker when he tried to do stories about, you know, the positivity of Spider-Man that her editor's going, you know, get out of here with that crap. Give me something that'll make some headlines. Yeah. Or more like, no, this is not what we're going to do. The editorial policy of, you know, the Commonwealth Tribune is to support the administration. Right, right. You know, this is not, this is not good news. This is not something we're going to support. Oh, right. So, uh, it's, 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 right. It's just, it seems like 
like that's not going to happen because we already saw that scene where her editor was like, no, you basically summarized the thing, you know, yeah. the, the head or whatever from the Milton's. Um, so it's like, okay, yeah, there's not a free press, but then it's like, okay, you guys are like, Oh, let's go let's investigate and do all this other stuff. But then it's like, but who are you going to tell? Like, well, it's, it's, it's still back to my favorite old movie trope of, you know, ambitious cub reporter gets stuck covering the home and garden show and breaks you know, the story about crime and corruption and murder and mayhem. I just don't know how that's going to go. And I'm on board with you as far as granted Rosita and Eugene are probably going to listen but are they the most effective people to bring into the loop to try to get something done? Right. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe not. And of all things, isn't it funny how after all this time, they're still pulling Rosita and Eugene together? <laughs> yeah, they're like, they're the pair. Well, they're the pair. And it's so bad in a way because we know how you know, we know what she said to him before mm. when Eugene had his his science fair project about how to take care of the baby. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's like there's just it, it's just it's just weird that like they're 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 almost like a doing almost like bottle episodes of just these like a little groups like, okay, well, mm -hmm. Daryl and them are like d doing their thing. So that they'll do their thing. And then it's like, okay, who do we have left? Oh, that's right. We have, um, uh, Connie and Kelly and then, oh yeah, Eugene Rosita. Okay, cool. Yeah. Like, well, let's do their little thing together. And then of course, Carol's going to just do her own thing. And right. You know, but it's well, like, but but no one crosses paths or like they're not talking to each other, which seems very strange of like, right. that's not how our people, that's not what our people do. <laughs> well, and just to kind of riff on that, it's like we've got, I won't even say A story, B story. It's like we've got, you know, the Daryl storyline. We've got the Eugene storyline, we've got the Connie storyline and we're getting pieces of each one running its own course and they're running more or less parallel to each other, but we haven't gotten the crossover bit that what I kind of see as well is when all of these storylines come back together, that's going to give us this huge point of friction in this big thing, because we already know that Carol's working her thing, her line with Hornsby. We know that Daryl has Daryl, Aaron and Gabriel have had their conflict with Hornsby that also involves the external folks, Maggie and Negan. Um, We've got Leah in the mix who is coming after Maggie and Daryl. So I'm thinking where all this comes back together is where we get our sudden huge ball of conflict because I, I kind of see that all these parallel storylines could all collide because they're all sort of interleaved around Hornsby, Sebastian, what's going on with the upper management of Commonwealth and the underneath the surface stories of Hornsby's covert activities, Hornsby's drug dealing, Sebastian's money problems, you know, Sebastian being a little bastard. So I, I kind of see that what they're probably going to do is everything is going to come together and then it's going to be really ugly. And then, something's going to be tense and unresolved so that we can come back and finish up this, this series. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's what not necessarily bet. a hill I'm going to die on, but that is just my two dinars on what I think is coming. Well, that would make for a 
good like cliffhanger since we only have the one more episode. It's just like well, right, right, things- and and in case you're wondering, kids, this the the underlying note to all of what I just rattled off. The what is how does all this stuff work together? That my my one point of what sauce after all that verbiage was. So what are they going to do with it? Yep. <laughs> that we shall see. And I was going to say, see, I was able to tie all that together. Yes. <laughs> it's a good job. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, since since we've wadded our pants off, it's time for sad and all sauce. Aww. You want to take the first one? I will. Data from Detroit. Starts off with Mercer and Princess sitting in a tree. K I S S I N G. Mm-hmm. Okay, Princess, get your man. And she's got, <laughs> looks like lovey face emojis. And she's, I am here for it. <laughs> uh, they are cute. Uh, yep. All right. Well, next comes from Renee from Atlanta. And she, she's got, she has a, so- a sad and an awe, so I'll start with her sad sauce. She says, okay, I'm mad at Negan all over again. Angry face, angry face emoji. I was so sad when little Herschel was kneeling at his father's grave. When I tell you I was all in my feelings, and it's like bawling face emoji, that little boy looked like a sweet little angel. I wanted to slap Negan. <laughs> shrug, shrug emoji. Uh, next, she goes, King Ezekiel's going to die real soon. Oh, sad face emoji. That I'm not so sure of, but, you know, it can totally, totally happen. Just, I don't feel... Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess it is one of those things where it's like, you know, they say it's like, oh, like that moment before you die, you feel so good and everything, you know, you don't think, you know, everything's great. And he's, and he did say that he's still healing and still like, you know, it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's not going on, but I don't want him to die. Want him to be happy with Carol. Uh, and then she goes on to her. Uh, uh, he can't be happy with Carol. Carol's going to New Mexico with Daryl. <laughs> well, maybe, though, he still lives and they find a place and he's taking care of the kids. And then she's like, they get, oh. a, they get a motorcycle with a sidecar and a trailer. So they yes. can bring him along. <laughs> we don't know. Maybe that's what the spinoffs. <laughs> cow, cow, cow. All right. Well, she goes into her aw sauce and she says, uh, Eugene and Max go together like peanut butter and jelly. They are a match made in heaven. They match each other's quirkiness so well, and when they kissed, and she said, now what do I need to steal? I was like, she's in love. Please, please, Walking Dead, whatever you do, don't kill either one of them. And then pray emoji, pray emoji. Not to mention, she looks super cute in her outfit. Really, all our peeps that were inside the Commonwealth were looking cute. And kiss face emoji. Ah, so she liked, liked Max's outfit. Mm. Hmm. I like to... Oh, okay. Well, and then she goes on, Mercer hurting Prince's feelings. And then when he came back to apologize, I was like, aw. And Mercer looking all sad when he was talking about killing his soldiers and saying his parents didn't raise him that way. You could tell him and his sister came from a good, wholesome family. It's something about our peeps. We always seem to bring out the best in people. We make them realize you can't go along um, with the get along just because you have to decide if you want to walk around like everything is all good and pretend you're in Mayberry when you clearly see and know it is not right or do the right thing. I love that our peeps um, uh, do not accept things when they know it's not right. To me, it's about having morals and integrity and standing 10 toes down from what you believe in. Agreed. I think our people have our effect on Mercer and Max. And I think that obviously you know, with princess, like I have to, I, I mean, I just feel like that's what Mercer, you know, Mercer and Max have been doing their thing and even just towing the line because that's what they're supposed to, you know, they felt like it was supposed to yep. do, but then our people come in and influence them. And then they're starting to see like, yeah, I don't necessarily have to take this at face value and I could mm-hmm. do something about it. So, 
Uh, and then she goes on, Judith and RJ look so cute, all clean and washed up, but I'd rather they be dusty and dirty than to stay in that toxic environment. It's too many shady backdoor deals going on and I understand their kids and I don't know what's going on and they and don't know what's going on and all they care about is feeling safe and secure, but they have to get out of that place quick, fast and in a hurry. Uh, all right. Mm. Thank you, Renee. So we got some sad sauce from Mike from Asheville and he goes, Mercer confessing to princess. His pain came across and I'm hoping for great things for him now. Yep. I think we will. And then Emma from the UK, she says, so nice to see Judith and RJ heading to school like normal kids. Uh, seeing super soldier Mercer all v- vulnerable and Herschel sitting at Glenn's grave. Yeah. And then last is uh, Eugene and Max together at last. Please let this tension work out for Eugene. Would like to see them together at the end. And I will agree. And for me, of course, um, uh, being that I'll have to admit being kind of a squishy romantic somewhere <laughs> way deep, deep inside. Uh, I did, I did and do still enjoy the scenes with princess and Mercer. Cause I do think that they are both someone, the other needed. I think that princess needed somebody to ground her and fix her to a place. Because as she said earlier, you know, she'd been out on her own. And I think part of the sort of quirky crazy we saw before was she strikes me as very much like some friends of mine. that They are extroverts and they are people people. They need to be around people. And if they're not around people, then it that manifests itself in strange ways. Where me, you know, uh, my wife has come in for years that uh, me being the type of introvert that I am, you know, I could be happy by myself and self-entertained and not really notice that there was nobody there to a point. Um, The side note to that is through the pandemic working at home, I finally told her at one point, I said, when it gets to the point that the introvert misses people, you know, I've been I've been out of the loop for a long time, (laughs) you know, just to go to the grocery store to see people other than who I'm kin to. It's, but yeah, I think that princesses needs to feel connected and she needs people interaction. And that's why I think she's good working at the record store. You know, when she was selling, the albums to Judith and her friend, you could kind of see that she's one of those people that she's in her element. And she talked about before, I've got my little apartment with my little cat and I'm, you know, I'm happy. Well, now she's got her little apartment, her little cat and her huge hulking boyfriend. Yeah. So I think it's good for her. And I, and conversely, I think it's good for Mercer because when you are in that sort of position where you are the authority figure and you always have to be strong and professional and, you know, you can't, you know, you can't necessarily show weakness. You can show, you can be compassionate, you can be sensitive, but you can't look vulnerable. Yeah. And, you know, he's worn that mask for so long and sort of lived into that role that it causes a lot of it causes a lot of uh, personal trauma. It causes a lot of, it's tough on you. And I'm speaking from experience on that, that uh, again, you know, just to talk about the lovely and long suffering Mrs. LT that, you know, she's one of the reasons I lasted as long as I did when I was on the street, because I would not give her, you know, gross and gory details, but I know that I could, you know, share with her the fact that this particular call bothered me and, you know, this particular thing I had to do bothered me. And, you know, I got to tell her that, you know, I had to deal with this couple who was experiencing this bit of trauma and you, you never, 
get to see people at their best. You always see people at their worst and you have to remain professional and clear headed and, you know, objective. And it's, it's tough. And it, that's, that sort of sigs into what uh, Tommy's going through. Because when you talk about uh, things going on in the world professionally, uh, two of the highest suicide rates amongst professions are, you know, cops and doctors. And you kind of see that with Tommy this episode, that part of the reason he enjoyed baking cakes so much is because when you're a surge, when you're a doctor, especially a surgeon and especially a thoracic surgeon, you know, people's lives are literally in your hand and they are relying on your decisions in the moment to save their lives. And it is a it's a lot of stress. And you can see that maybe one of the reasons that he wanted to get away from being a doctor was because you do it long enough and either you get hardened to it, you find an outlet for it, or it consumes you. Yeah. And the outlets you find are not necessarily healthy outlets because we noticed that he's probably started to drink a little bit or maybe a lot bit. So I, I like his character. I like the fact that, you know, you watch, if you watch a lot of doctor shows, you know, the doctor, you never get to see that side of it. You know, right. you have, you, you have more so in the last few years, but, you know, traditionally you don't see the guy going, you know, did I do the right thing? I lost a patient today. You know, all you see is, you know, like, oh, well, you know, I did a so-and-so and I resected his thingamabob and I took out his, you know, his what's it gland and now he's going to be healthy and play the violin again. <laughs> and so that was, that was, that was kind of tough there. Um, and just to finish out, since I went from, you know, romance to emotional suffering, I'm going to go back to romance is that I wanted Eugene to find his dream girl. I am glad that he and Max are starting to work out. And I really, really hope that I don't end up getting game game of throned on this, <laughs> but, um, uh, I did kind of have a warm, fuzzy spot when I'm like, I was yelling at the TV. It's like, just kiss her, man. Just kiss her. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, take that sweet administrative assistant into your arms and throw a lip lock on her. You know, kiss her. <laughs> Oh, because but you, I'm sorry, the long protracted lean in, <laughs> and and again as a spectacle wearer, I realize that the logistics of navigating a glass of the kiss is not <laughs> the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> However, comma, I was just going to say, you know, cowboy up, Eugene. <laughs> you know slip that slip that hand behind her neck and give her the give her the big googly eyed look and then just kiss her uh, yes he well we'll see but you know he we'll, we'll see and yeah he always kind of gets to that point but then gets scared away so it'd be nice to see him just be like yeah no stopping him just do it it's like it's like commit yeah. Go ahead and commit. But anyway, that's, like I said, that's, you know, LT's big book of romance coming soon. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm tickled. I, I'm tickled with the way that it's worked out with Princess and Mercer. Primarily because, too, I just have, I have enjoyed listening to Paula Lazaro talk about it on Talking Dead so much. She is so funny. And uh, I said, high hopes for those two. Don't know what's going to happen, but we'll see. Uh, 
I, I'm glad that we finally, after all all the radio drama and faux Stephanie, that you know maybe we'll get some payoff for Eugene. Yes, I agree. And just to finish up, yes, I will. I will see your Herschel sitting at Glenn's grave and raise you one. Just the fact of we are talking about Maggie and Glenn's son. And whenever Hornsby was doing the, you know, hey, kid, have you been on any trips lately? You know, it's just I'm going, Herschel's going to go, no. Right, right. (laughs) Because I'm sure I am. I am absolutely sure that at some point Maggie said, "Okay, Herschel, you know that we don't talk. We don't talk to strangers and we don't talk to guys wearing ugly ties and strange vests. (laughs) And whenever it got to the point where I said, Hornsby's messing with Herschel, I said, this is not going to turn out well. This is not going to turn out well at all. Because what else have we learned about our group over the years? You don't screw with Judith. You don't screw with RJ. You don't screw with Herschel. And I would even say, if you noticed, even, even Lydia fell into that. You know, once she became one of our people, then it's like, you know, we take care of our own and especially the kids. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. So I was going, this is not going to end well, but yeah, the, you know, big props to the little guy who plays Herschel because, you know, after last week, it's like, oh, so I finally met the guy that killed dad. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I got to see all that stuff, you know, and now I've got this creepy guy asking me questions. So, yeah, I think that's, I think I've awed myself out there. So. <laughs> oh, well, aw. <laughs> aw. Uh, Do you have anything, Kyle? Or have we pretty well, we pretty well awed, awed all over everything? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I you put, made a lot of, uh, good points um about like this the difference you know like what but princess and uh mercer like because it like when you were talking about you know princess and like how she kind of was surviving and she needs people but you know we we saw that whenever we first met her she like mm-hmm. made she made walkers you know dress up and like put them in like stage positions you know uh, you know stage them so that she had mm-hmm. people to talk to and stuff like that so she created that you know that kind of world for herself because she hadn't seen anybody and for you know however long it was and then also with mercer who you're saying is yeah for sure like you know, he is in a, 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 in a position of like power and like, you know, to like leadership, you know, like at least to, you know, pe- that people look up to him. But it's also like, yeah, you do that for so long where it's like, yeah, he, he has no one to really kind of like basically at the end of the day, you know, release and vent to or to talk to, you know, I, he probably doesn't do that with, you know, Max because she's, you know, probably dealing with everything that you know, she has to deal with Pamela. Well, so think it, about, think about the big brother dynamic with that too. Well, you know, yeah, he's still in the position of like protector of his, you know, mm-hmm. sister. So it's like, you know, he's not going to want to be telling her stuff. That's going to possibly get her in trouble or go seek trouble or whatever. So he's still, yeah. So he's never seemingly, we're assuming that he just doesn't have an outlet to be able right. to kind of like, process all the stuff that he has to deal with, which is why we see him so mad when he's, you know, working out. It's like, cause that's what he's using as his like kind of a release. But so mm-hmm. I, yeah, definitely some good points. And it's just, you know, it's happy that they're, you know, they're, they're finding this connection and hopefully Eugene and Max do the same thing. But again, this is where walking dead, they could step in and we like, Oh no, no, this is awesome to be like the rug gets pulled out from under us. And, and I don't want to see that, but like, yeah, knock on woods. They didn't do it to Rick and Michonne badly, but they still kind of had their jerky moments. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I was going to say we we know, and just to just to do our series segue couple, you know, God knows Dwight and Cherry. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's they... been that's been your Harlequin romance story for the apocalypse the entire time. Yeah. All right. Well, if we're all done with sads and alls, that means it's time for some feedback. We can talk about it. We're done talking. Time to listen. Well, I will start with Renee uh, voicemail because um, she again got us a voicemail, and I had to cut. You know, I, there was a part of it that I figured it was like felt better at later in, you know, right. our discussion. So I cut it up, and um, we'll start with her voicemail, and then go right into her written feedback. And so I will go ahead and start that. Hi, guys. This is Renee from Fairburn, and my voice is all raspy again because this Georgia pollen is ridiculous. And I'm not going to say Georgia because Savannah, I'm from Savannah, and Savannah does not have pollen like this. This Atlanta, this Atlanta pollen is so thick. Like, it is super, super ridiculous. It makes no sense. So my voice goes from normal today and... Uh, uh, raspy tomorrow. It's like back and forth. It is really freaking ridiculous. But I just wanted to know if you guys noticed um, Daryl. My mother and I were discussing this and I'm like, he just reminds me, his movement reminds me of Rick so much. Him and Rick, you can tell they are super connected. They're brothers because Daryl and Rick, they're always looking out of their peripheral when they're looking. They give you that side eye and they look like they're waiting for something to pop off. Like, I pop off if you want to. That's the look that they have. And I really don't understand how crazy eyes have not noticed it yet. But, of course, he's a narcissist, so he's not going to notice because he does not live in reality. But Daryl never has on his uniform, like, never. So you know that he's not really a Commonwealth trooper. That's the one giveaway to me. But, you know, his look, like, you see his face. You can actually see his facial expressions, and he is giving you that look and his movement. It's not like he's moving or he's walking, but he has this sway, this little swag, like he moves from side to side, like he's sizing you up. That's it right there. He's sizing you up. And Rick did the same thing. Rick, that was Rick Grimes. That was his MO. You would see him look from the side and you could see him sizing you up, like pop off if you want to. Pop off if you want to. So that's what Dar- that's how Daryl was looking. That's how he always looking. Like, I'm ready. He stay on go. Daryl stays on go. Period. Period. So I just wanted to notice, it, ask you guys, if you guys noticed that as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Renee. Um, actually, yeah, I kind of, like, uh, totally agree with you. It's like he, he just... I don't know. It's just like his mannerism, stuff like that. You always know that he's always th- like thinking about like, or I guess actually just him dealing with like Lance. Um, you know, we know that he's not on his side and we know that he's like Rick, you know, like he's going along with it to some degree, but he's also kind of like trying to stay, stay one step ahead so that he protects our group, you know, mm-hmm. like the people he cares about. So you do see him kind of like, he's like a little shifty eye or like he looks at like uh, Aaron and Gabriel when he was, they were being questioned and you could just see what he's saying. is like, Oh yeah. Like, I'm just going to say, yeah, no, I'm like, they've, I've, I've been with them for a long time. And it's like, you know, what they say is that that's what it is. But then you also do see that he's, he kind of is like, he's not falling in. Like he doesn't wear his helmet, you know, like, and then, you know, Lance like keeps, especially in this episode, he keeps says like, like suit up soldier. Or it's like, okay, but yeah, put the helmet on soldier, like trying to kind of be like, Hey, you're, you're one of my, you know, like you're under my command or whatever. And Daryl's kind of like, eh, okay, whatever. Um, and then we see it at the end where, you know, he turns his guns, you know, basically onto Lance, to protect, you know, Maggie and all of them. So it's kind of like he's, he's treading a, a, a really, yeah, like treading this tight line between trying to kind of like stay on, like trying to keep his, you know, one foot in with the Commonwealth so that he can yep. 
pivot and be able to do what he needs to do. Totally different than how Carol does it, you know, but they both kind of have a same little deal like MO. And, you know, I would say that's very kind of a Rick Grimish, which he's kind of that right now. <laughs> well, and I think the thing with Daryl is Daryl and Carol are both kind of playing along. The difference is Carol is way more stealthy about it in a way you know daryl is not he's not being dishonest he's like yeah i'm playing your game but i'm not one of your boys mm-hmm. uh all right well let's go into renee's feedback and she says this episode was really good to me i knew all along that daryl was not going to turn his back on his family You know, people on the internet were saying, I can't believe Daryl, but I never questioned that scene when they showed it on the very first episode. They're entirely too close for him to turn his back on them. They remind, um, reminded of the crew of Z nation. They used to say it's the humans you have to worry about, not the zombies. And that's definitely my sentiments. Exactly. While crazy eye is running around trying to take down Maggie. Our peeps are going to destroy it from the inside. And I cannot wait. Strong arm, strong arm emoji. (laughs) Maggie set Crazy Eye up real good when it came to that truck. I mean, he literally thought he had her looking all smug. I didn't appreciate him um, either asking a child's question like that. Just goes to show you he has no morals or integrity, but as usual, Elijah came through all stealthy. (laughs) You cannot tell me Pamela does not know what's going on. She came from a political background, so she knows about shady folks, and anyone that has a sadistic child like Sebastian is not right because she raised him and she knows his character, but she continues to turn a blind eye because she made him like that, and she's okay with him being like that as long as it doesn't get in her way. If my son behaved like that, he would have been reprimanded, and it would definitely not be okay with me for him to boss people around because um, I'm his mother and I run things. <laughs> That's like Jeff Joffrey and Ramsey Bolton on Game of Thrones. Their family knew that they were God awful. And so were their families for allowing it. That's why I say Pamela knows. Ned Stark did not allow his kids to behave that way because he was a man of integrity and morals and that Leah needs to go away real quick and does crazy eyes. Uh, no, she has a vendetta against our peeps, or is it co- or coincidental that he wants to hire her to kill Maggie? Because he's definitely what he wants, I believe. Man, I cannot believe we're at the end and are about to go on hiatus, but hey, at least we have fear. <laughs> yes, we do. Peace and love. Heart emoji, heart emoji, heart emoji. <laughs> ah, thank you, Renee. Um, yeah, we, we assume Pamela knows some things i don't know if if, at least i don't feel like i can say that she knows everything but you know she put him in that position to be kind of take care of things for her and so that she can do her parties and you know be the the figurehead so i don't know well i guess we'll. that's right because i don't think she necessarily knows about sebastian all the way just that yeah he's a spoiled brat and she kind of is like the most we've seen of her doing anything to him that would be kind of like reprimanding him was just basically cutting off his credit. <laughs> and then we saw with that. If she cut him off and he's still doing stuff, he's not sitting at home in his room playing Minecraft. Yeah, I guess it was just the way my parents were is I couldn't, I never got away with much. Uh, only because if it had been a situation where I was older and I had spending money and dad knew that I didn't get it from him and it was more spending money than I had earned at my job, dad would be asking questions. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So maybe I think it's not necessarily that Pamela knows, but is Pamela worried about so many other things that she's not paying attention Because the counter to she's a politician and she knows what's going on is, well, I can name a few other politicians with children that they really didn't know what was going on with them. So I don't know. So I guess our next set of feedback comes from Dieta from Detroit. And she says, so Eugene asked Max to help him snoop around, knowing she would not only risk her career, but likely her life. 
Max would ask her brother Mercer for help to find the secret to the Commonwealth, but he is still thinking about the assassination of two of his soldiers. We know they deserved it and apparently weren't missed, but murder isn't his thing, so he's in his feelings about it. Hornsby questioning Aaron and Gabriel about the River Bend fiasco. Loved how they kept the straight faces while answering Hornsby's questions. Then, to help prove their story off, that they'd swarm if walkers without blinking. Yep, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Ezekiel with the side clinic and the animal clinic. Not sure how they were able to pull that off with Commonwealth soldiers watching everybody's moves, or are they all out with Hornsby? (laughs) She has some laughing face emojis there. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense how they are pulling it off without the Commonwealth police not having a clue. But then he gets the doctor and Carol involved. I roll. Well, let's hope it stays secret. Yeah, that's one thing we have not really seen uh, really at all is that, you know, we know that they have the Commonwealth soldiers and they obviously serve in that police and then the military or, you know, outside the walls kind of deal. But they haven't really shown a lot of like what it's like to just be walking down the street. Are they like, you know, set, are they standing around like every, you know, corner and like checking your papers or like, you know, do whatever it's like, you know, we haven't really seen how they operate on that regard. So it's kind of, I, you know, they're not quite like a police state that we have seen. Right. I mean, someone could probably, you know, tattle on them and then that's when they get involved. But mm-hmm. Well, I said that's just one of those things. So she goes on to say, love the Maggie, Elijah, and Daryl standoff with Hornsby. He just doesn't get our people will crush him in the Commonwealth if need be because we don't play around with our kids. Lance says, it's a shame we couldn't be friends before leaving Hilltop empty handed. But he isn't done searching for those guns as luck would have it. His big break comes in the darkness of night. Somehow. His troops locate a small, heavily armed tent where two soldiers are promptly shot without warning by none other than Leah. The gun-toting Leah actually stops shooting long enough to listen to Hornsby. He says he has a job for her. Even though she single-handedly stole his guns, killed his soldiers, and is surviving all alone, and then she actually listened to him, is that just dumb luck? She doesn't know him, but she's willing to strike a deal with him? And she got some chin scratches emojis. Maggie is going to finish her. I can't wait. And she finishes up by saying, everybody's got secrets now. I say, just leave the Commonwealth before it all blows up with our people in the middle. Overall, darn good episode. The show has finally picked up momentum and giving us good season ending episodes. Finally. (laughs) And I would agree. Completely. All right. Well, next is Emma from the UK. and She says, all in all, not as exciting as the previous two episodes, but this one one was getting the pieces in place for, hopefully, the revolution. Seeds were down for Mercer to lead that and become the new leader of the Commonwealth, I hope. By the way, love the idea of the Walking Dead Westworld crossover with the robot Mercer. Oh, that would be something. Okay, Mike from Asheville says, I feel this episode moved the story forward. Showdown between Hilltop and Leah and Commonwealth is coming. Cool. We knew it was. Glad to see it soon. I have high hopes that this storyline gets wrapped up in the mid-season finale. Then part three will be all about wrapping up the show and leading to whatever they're going. Mercer taking over Commonwealth and our people split between Commonwealth and going off on their own? Who knows? I'm hoping the episodes stay action-packed and fun. Finish strong. And I will say amen to that. Yes. It's been... It's been... It's been good. Like that's what I'm. We've been saying it's just like, I'm, and I'm, I'm. I feel like we're seeing it in our listeners' comments too. And it's just like, yes, it's like there was. It seemed like there was a bit of like a little lull or drag, and we're just like, oh, what's going on? Let's like see how this goes. To like, okay, this is this is The Walking Dead. Like I'm, I'm ready for it. And then now we're having the mid season part two f- finale coming up and then we go right into fear <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> which i'm looking forward to because i'm more of like this is just going to be more fun like not so serious like what's going on or like how are they going to do this to being like okay there's going to be some you know atomic pintos and 
you know, Madison back to like, you know, then all of a sudden then come back and jump into, you know, back into the last part of the walking dead. So it's kind of like, okay, if they can just keep this pace, then I'm all for it. Yeah. And, and like Mike said, I want them to finish strong. Same here for sure. Oh, all right. Um, all right, next comes from Glenn's from Toronto, and she says, she broke this down, I think, about just about characters. So the first group she's talking about is Carol, Ezekiel, and Tommy. She says, poor Carol is battle-weary with the termites, wolves, saviors, whispers, and now the Commonwealth. <laughs> uh, Carol is afraid to love again for the fear of losing loved ones again, but against her better judgment, she is revisiting those feelings with Ezekiel, even though she says she doesn't love him. Uh, Ezekiel is empowered by Carol to do good with his new lease on life, but a little scary. He says, thank you to Carol. Then things go well and walking dead deaths pr- pricks up its ears. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> Was also reminded of Nicholas saying thank you to Glenn. And then he's gone. Oh, uh. Please don't say it so. I mean, I can't, I can't disagree. That's The Walking Dead. Can, and they. I think we've even made comments before about like, all right, you know, who, you know, it's kind of been a while before someone that we, like one of our main characters have actually died. Um, so we'll see. Uh, she goes on, she says, Carol's indeed in a position of power at the Commonwealth for the favor she did for Lance to get Ezekiel and Tommy bailed at, as it were. What else has she done for Lance besides outs that leader of that group for sealing supplies meant for the group to be so influential to the extent of being able to order the soldiers around? And that is a big, big question, question mark, because nothing has shown like that how did she get there? Um, she even was like skirting around the issue with Ezekiel um, when he was like trying to be like, oh, hey, like come see, like play hooky or whatever. And she's like, no, 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 no. It's like, like I, I, my job, I'm too busy today. And she's like, oh, the job at the bakery. And she's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, um, oh, I, I got another job. And like, and then she totally like kind of like, oh, no, no. She's like, just trust me. Um, but you know, yeah, you know, we haven't seen that yet. So I, I'm assuming we will see something about like how was she able to sit there and bail them out, basically, and then just right. tell the, and tell the soldiers like, oh, I have this, you know, like yes, somehow she got uh, Lance to basically say, oh, when I'm gone, she is in command or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh. Uh, And then she goes on, Tommy asking if the patient was human was rather funny and diffused the tense and serious situation a little, though that uh, um, operating um, or that uh, operating room didn't seem to be the most sterile room. And Tommy was sweating sweetly while cutting away. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, it is they, you know, did what they had to do, I guess. Um. All right, then next she's talking about Eugene, Max, and Rosita with Connie and Kelly. She's like, Nancy Drew detective work is required by Connie. Kelly and Max to discover why and what else is happening with the case of the disappearing people. Poor Rosita is the lost wheel in the Walking Dead plot line. Uh, Still not feeling the romance between Eugene and Max. Max, do take off those ridiculous glasses. They don't make you look more like a brainiac. (laughs) Uh, and then th- uh, the next set, she said, Mercer, Princess, and Max. She goes, oh, Mercer and Princess are so sweet together. It took courage for Mercer to open up to Princess, seeing as she- he's the leader of the Commonwealth soldiers. And as he said, it was happening right under their noses. He was dealing with shame and guilt for not noticing it sooner or ignoring the signs because of who Sebastian's mother was. All the muscles and physiques presence um, of Mercer, you could feel his angry at being played like a fool by Sebastian. When he was doing the workout sets and getting more and more stressed as Max was talking to him, and Mercer, I think, realizing he can't stand by any longer and allow this to continue to happen. So, Mercer's first name is Mike or Michael. So, Max and Mike, you can just see the Walking Dead writers with their white and storyboards deciding on his name and changing Stephanie's name to Max. (laughs) Yep. 
Okay, she goes on to say Aaron, Gabriel, Daryl, Lance, and Maggie. This was the interesting media exchange at the episode. Daryl's knowing backward glance at Gabriel and Aaron when they finish telling Lance what happened at Riverbend. Is Lance trying to get Aaron and Gabriel killed? Death by walkers? With that crazed look on Lance's face when Aaron, Gabriel, and Daryl were killing those walkers. She goes on to say, what if the truck had started at the hilltop? Would there have been a free-for-all fight right then and there? Where are the Riverbend folks hiding out if not at the hilltop? It was good thinking by Maggie that Lance and the soldiers would appear before too long looking for someone to blame. And she says, Lance and Herschel. It reminded me when the saviors were searching Hilltop and Maggie and Daryl were hiding in that cellar and where Daryl said he was sorry for what happened to Glenn, that he was partly responsible for when he hit Negan. So who of all the people should pop out of the cellar than Lance and bump into Herschel, son of Glenn? It's clear that Lance knows what happened and that Maggie and company are responsible, but he enjoys this cat and mouse game and putting up a front of showing how diplomatic and reasonable he is. Lance was goading Herschel into saying something incriminating, but Herschel handled the situation very well. He's had a good teacher, Maggie. Putting that cap back on Herschel's head, just like a mini Glenn. Daryl will also need to tread carefully as to Lance. He's just a soldier and he's been insubordinate by training his gun on Lance instead of Maggie, an action Lance won't forget about since Lance is continually sliding Daryl. And she finishes up with Lance and Leah. So Lance asked Leah to do a job, despite knowing now that the Riverbend people were innocent and only defending themselves. But yet he's going to ask Leah to kill Maggie and the Riverbend group when they locate them. Daryl is going to be forced to face off and shoot Leah. Is this in game to overthrow Pamela of the Commonwealth? A civil war is brewing with Mercer, Daryl, Carol, Ezekiel, Aaron, Gabriel, Rosita, make yourself useful again, and on one side, and Lance, Sebastian, Pam, and whatever number of Commonwealth soldiers that aren't loyal to Mercer and threatened by Lance to stay and fight for him or else. (laughs) Wow. Uh, Yeah. No. Good stuff, Glennis. Good stuff. For sure. Yeah. It's, again, and we were just kind of bringing this up, um, or like you did too. It's like, like Leah, like Lance, basically, yeah, it's like the the enemy of my f- enemy is my friend, but Leah is a little bit on her own, and also it's like it, it turned from Lance's like mission of like being like, hey, my guns got stolen, and we don't even know exactly what that was all about. Like if he was that was part of some like um underground thing that he's doing or was it an actual real commonwealth you know deal it was just it, it, this all seems very shady to be you know begin with but he's all bent on being like okay i need to find those guns and whoever's you know stole them and are responsible blah 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 and then all of a sudden leo shows up is like oh and you you have the guns and now i'm just like oh i have a job for you but obviously the whole twist on that is because you know he's he he's out for Maggie because he knows Maggie is a threat to him and his position. So, I mean, it's kind of like, oh, yeah. you know, he, him making that calculation and be like, Oh, who's this? And then like, okay. Like, like he doesn't know who she is though. She just think he, he only knows that it's like, Oh, here's this crazy woman that shot two of my soldiers or whatever. And so I'm just going to give her a job. Like, that's the thing. He doesn't know her at all. So it, it, it feels a little weird of like why he would put so much kind of not trust, but like, oh, oh, here's here's my wild card that I can play. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, I, like unless we get to see something in the next episode that would kind of make it fit a little bit better. But it's at the same time, it's that's a pretty big ask to be like, oh, who is this person that I don't know? Is he just... Like, you know, is he impressed the fact that he stole his guns (laughs) and like, and kind of like took care of herself? So I don't know. That is a little kind of iffy just to how it all played out. But in the end, that's what we know. That's why she, you know, the, the, the loop, it's like, okay, 
uh, Maggie Shotter was trying to kill her, killed all their other people. Yep. Should should have ended it there, but Daryl let her go or got you know stopped it and let and she got away to like. Yeah, this is just turning back around, and oh, I cannot wait to see the surprise on their face <laughs> when they see it's her. <laughs> well, and we did, we did kind of call it, didn't we? Yeah, it's like she's she's gonna still be around, and then she's going to show up. <laughs> yep, we did call it. <laughs> uh, all right. I don't think I had anything else to comment on her. Well, and I think I think everybody's summed it up. I've said it once. I'm just curious to see how they tie all this together. Yeah. We got one episode and it's like, even from the, like the preview at the end of this episode, you know, a lot of stuff's going on. <laughs> so, yep. and, and I actually have not, I won't pull a Brian and try to look it up, but it's like, I'm, I'm wondering if it's like a, like a, a longer episode than when I've normally gotten. I mean, to get a little bit more, you know, more story in, or is it just going to be gun blazing and just right to it? We'll see. But I think we're in for a treat. All right, Glennis, thank you so much again. Best feedback ever. Yep. Well, if we've gotten through that, it's time for the news. There's a couple of weird stories on the news. All right. Well, talking about ratings, The Walking Dead season eleven, episode fifteen, actually was down a little bit in the you know the numbers. It was uh, got a point three seven in eighteen forty nine with one point six seven three million viewers, but it got a point five nine in the twenty five fifty four and a point nine seven in the fifty plus. So it went down in the main target demo, but it's actually up with viewers. But the Interesting part was last uh, week, season 11, episode 14, got a 0.40 in 1849 with 1.552 million viewers, but um, got a 0.58 in the 2554 and a 0.85 in the 50 plus. So, I mean, it jumped 12 points <laughs> in the 50 plus. So, I think we got a lot of, you know, old school viewers like basically like sticking with this and we came out and sh- force well and that's still back to my i don't know how they cook these numbers so the decimal rating is down but it looks like that the non-prime demographics of which i am a member now (laughs) were were actually up because like you said it looks like that the the old fans are coming back the newer old fans are coming back. It's just that the younger folks are were not watching as much. Yeah. So even though even though the viewership was up because it was the non prime demographic and the number was down, even though there were more viewers. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, you know the the target demo is what and you know and I think I've mentioned this many of times with uh, Brian because I did not I don't even know if I like I even see it because there's you know there's like the plus seven and then like you know where they do the ratings um, for those that don't watch it when it airs but then watch it within the first like two days or the same day, right. but afterwards. And I guarantee you so many people don't watch this when it airs. You watch it after like some other show you're watching or what were the Grammys on last week or what was, it? um, <clears throat> or yeah, it was like the Oscars one week then the Grammys, Grammys the next. The next week. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, everybody's going to be probably watching that. And then after it's over, then like switch to it. And you know, heck we do that with like, discovery and all that it's like because it's streaming so you just watch it whenever you do you know it's not like i'm watching it between seven and eight (laughs) o'clock uh well and then talking dead uh season episode 15 was up a little bit i got a 0.16 in 1849 with 702,000 viewers and that is up from last week's seven or season 11 episode 14 which got a 0.15 in 1849 with 619,000 viewers so again like we said last week it's like everything's pretty much holding fairly steady so i'm hoping that we get 
to see, you know, like hopefully the, the mid season finale part two gets a much bigger jump. And I was glad to see that talking dead was up this week. Yeah, it was. And it's always a good thing. Um, did it air right after? Yes. Okay. Again, there's no into the badlands <laughs> interrupting it. Right. And I definitely think that them showing it after the episode makes a huge difference in the ratings. Yep. I would agree. Cause that's how it used to always be. And that's how I was watching it. Um, Cause I mean, I don't watch the talking dead as much. I try to like catch up on it, but it's just, yeah, it's like, sometimes it's like, I don't watch the show anymore because I'm AMC plus like right when it airs. Um, I usually watch it on Monday or then catch up and do all that stuff. But I'm one of those viewers. I, I used to be with Neil Sins and now it's like, <laughs> so it mattered that I was like watching it when it aired. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, I checked the parrots and they did not post anything for this week. So I even just checked it right now. So we'll have to check that whenever we record next week. Um, so no, no, cra no cracker for you parrot. Nope. And I'm sure SpongeBob SquarePants is probably still number one, but <laughs> we'll just we'll leave it at that. All right. Well, then that goes into our news. And we have one little bit of news that Samantha Morton, who played Alpha, will return in Tales of the Walking Dead. Uh, and it'll be a single episode of that six part anthology series. And there are no plots or story um you know, details that have been released, but, uh, she is the one, well, she's the only one that has been announced at least of someone from the main show being, you know, returning, you know, right. to this. So it's like, I don't know. There was some talk about like, or I guess princess or, uh, she was interviewed, right? I forgot who it was. Um, but like said that like would want to, be a part of the anthology and part of the right. stories. So we don't know if anybody else will, you know, get dropped in there, but I mean, the cast that they've announced, is pretty substantial. <laughs> and if it's only six episodes, it's almost kind of like, you know, I'm almost kind of, if it's, well, we'll see because if it's good, I'm sure they'll order more, but um, just looking forward to it though. Cause I'm sure this will be probably more pre alpha coming in terms, you know, there's nothing mentioned about Lydia, so we don't know. That's right. We don't know yet. Yeah. So, but when we do, we will definitely have it on the podcast. And it'll be nice. It'll be not. And like I said, it'll be nice to have her back for sure. Um. All right. Well, LT, you want to tell people how to interact with us? I shall. So we want to encourage you to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. That's at Walking Dead TTM. To submit your theories and feedback, most people post in our designated episode thread in our Facebook group. That's facebook.com slash groups slash Walking Dead TTM. You can send us email. That's Walking Dead at TalkThroughMedia.com. You can utilize our feedback forum. That's on the website at TalkThroughMedia.com slash feedback. You can leave us voicemail. Just call area code 216-232-6146. And remember that the message caps out at about three minutes. Remember that all of our new episodes are on YouTube. Just search for Talk Through Media and remember to subscribe and click that bell to get notified when we have new videos. Those videos go out first before the podcast does. To support us, like and review the Talk Through Media Facebook page. You can find that at facebook.com slash talkthroughmedia. And the best way you can support us is in our Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash walking dead talk through. Uh, we release uh, um, an early uh, a release um, episode of the show. Basically, it's just like the unedited version of what we record tonight. And you get it before the main podcast comes out. It's, um, I think, 
you know, our patrons have definitely been enjoying it. Um, getting to hear how we kind of <laughs> saw the mistakes or the sausage, as we like to call it. So definitely thank you all, uh, Patreons, for uh, supporting us. And hopefully you're enjoying those early accesses. Um, so I'd like to thank Clint McCollum, Renee Murray, Dieta Patterson, Lawrence Todd, the guy over there. Hello. And me, <laughs> Kyle McAdams. Kyle McAdams. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that Dieta, Clinton, and Renee will be getting an early version of the episode this week. Uh, you can subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts or your podcast client of choice. And while you're there, give us a rating or review. And you can also leave us a review at podchaser.com. There you can actually rate individual episodes or you can rate the whole podcast. And always remember to share our posts on Facebook and Twitter when we post them or tell a friend. Word of mouth is the best way to get us new listeners. All right. Um... Well, to wrap it up, I would like to play another little, because this kind of leads into some of the other things about what's ha- what else we're covering on the Talk Through Media. Um, so I'll play Renee's uh, voicemail. And then also um, the Northmen, they show the previews and I'm like, OMG, I cannot wait until this comes out. This is my type of movie. I love this type of movie. It reminds me of Game of Thrones. Like, I got super super excited. And I want to know also if you guys like shows like that. Because I noticed, like, some other podcasts, they preview, um, they do um, podcasts about movies. And I see that y'all only do it, like, for as The Walking Dead, Fear. Um, I know you guys don't do any other podcasts or on movies and stuff. So, but of course, if you did, I would be one of your biggest listeners. But okay, talk to you guys later. Hi, LT. Hi, Brian. And hi, Cal, my sweetheart. <laughs> I will talk to you guys later. And I cannot believe we only have one episode left. I mean, until we go on our little hiatus. And, but you know, hey, it's, and then not only that, I think it's only eight after we come back from the hiatus. And that will be the end of The Walking Dead. So Rick Grimes, he better damn show up. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> uh, thank you, Renee. Okay, I play- <laughs> I played that because like, it's like, what else are we covering on Talk Through Media? And, well, we actually, uh, obviously, uh, The Walking Dead and Fear, as you know, that we do with you and uh, me and... Um, and Brian, but um, we also covered Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard. Brian and Ruthie uh, do that podcast, and actually, uh, Brian did give us an update. And I will just let you take off with the best Brian voice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Brian says, Brian here. This is just to let you know that we have not stopped doing the podcast. As most of you know that listen to us on Discovery, I had to do a complex multi-state move, more complex than I could say on air. That made it impossible for me to record, though we tried a few times. We actually tried recording our first episode in weeks last night, but I had to stop a couple of minutes into the recording. A medieval fair jumbo-sized turkey leg from early in the afternoon decided that it wasn't going to agree with me. And he included a very green, very sick emoji. (laughs) We're going to try again in a few days with episodes covering Picard Season 2, Episode 1, and Discovery Season 4, Episode 12, and then try to catch up by the time Strange New World airs. Sorry for the wait, and when we hopefully do come back in a few days, it will be worth it. I think it would have been easier if I'd have done nitpicking Brian voice. But. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, there's the update from Brian himself. Um, so they will be back. And um, he actually, I talked to him earlier today, and he definitely is missing being on the show with us. So hopefully he will be able to, he's behind on watching um, the, the, the Walking Dead episodes, but hopefully he said he might join us next week so stay tuned we'll see um but all in all overall just to like kind of like you know not just for renee but to all listeners it's like you know we do cover a lot of other you know shows we don't do movies but um you know when the walking dead (laughs) the walking dead movies come out we'll definitely do those but um and and just to be fair we've thought about doing some other things but you know, we're doing good to do what we're doing. 
<laughs> <laughs> no, right. It's like, that's, I was going to kind of put that into perspective too. It's like, we try to cover what we can and then. And I was going to say, I saw the commercial for that and Renee, you were the first person I thought of since you were talking about Vikings the other week. <laughs> so looks pretty exciting. Yep. Oh, uh, all right. Well, uh, if you're interested in listening to Brian and Ruthie cover Discovery and Picard, you can go over to Star Trek Discovery Podcast.com and Star Trek Picard.com. And they have a Facebook group for more information. You can find that at Facebook.com slash group slash Star Trek TTM Podcasts. And if you'd like to support them, they also have a Patreon f- and f- uh, for those podcasts. And you can find that at Patreon.com slash Brian and Ruthie. Uh, another uh, podcast that we have on the Talk Through Media is Revenge Deep Space Nine and Prodigy that are covered by James and Kim. Uh, it's they've been rewatching, uh, basically you know, rewatching uh, Deep Space Nine, and they're just covering um, each episode. I think they just finished season four of Deep Space Nine, but yeah, if you are interested to like you know listen to the um, to basically to re-binge Deep Space Nine all over again, which you should, <laughs> you can join them as they, like, you know, discuss the, um, each of the episodes. And the other Star Trek um, um, podcast we do is Star Trek Lower Decks, which will be starting, what, sometime this summer? Yep. And that is with me, LT, and Brian. We cover the cartoon. Yes, the cartoon. It's fun, <laughs> though. It's so fun. <laughs> I am excited for it to come back. Yes, Ruthie, I love you, but I can't say it any other <laughs> way now. It's the cartoon. <laughs> but it's good. She just doesn't like cartoons. All right. So next week, we have The Walking Dead, Season 11, Episode 16, Acts of God. It was written by Nicole Marante Matthews, directed by Katrona McKenzie. And the description is, Maggie prepares to defend Hilltop and the people of Riverbend against Hornsby. Meanwhile, Hornsby hires Leah to kill her. Indeed. So, with shock horror ringing in our ears, until next time, this is LT. And I'm Kyle. And this is the Walking Dead Talk. Good night, everyone. Good night.